All right, for quite a while now, we have um, we have been affiliated and uh, been had the honor <coughs> of being one of the supporting churches for Dan and Debbie Bender, who have been working with Takati Mission. It's kind of like I, you know, he, the man who needs no introduction here, but I'll introduce him anyway. Dan Bender from Takati Mission, and he's going to explain what's been going on both with Takati and in some new things that they're doing, branching out to do other ministries. Dan. Great to have you here today, brother. Good to see you. Thanks. God bless. I won't need this, Mike. You won't need the lot of good. No. <laughs> Thank you. It's like coming home. We love you, church. Thank you so much. For the love and support and prayers even in a building program even with some financial adversity you remain faithful to your missionaries and we're extremely grateful you can probably kill the monitors if I'm coming on the monitor at all you can probably kill that I don't like to listen to myself <laughs> one of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognized that he had answered them well, asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Say it with me if you know it. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Good job, church. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's kind of the mantra of this church. So I don't mean to be preaching to the choir. But a guy came to our church several years ago, had a book, titled it The Jesus Creed, and challenged us to memorize that and began to try to make personal applications. So Deb and I memorized what this author calls the Jesus Creed. It's a little variation from what we read in the different gospel accounts. And every night now, we lay in bed together and hold hands, and we pray for our family and people that we love, people that we've witnessed to, people we're concerned about. We pray for Graham and Edith Grouse every night because we love you guys. We're here indirectly because of them. We've been with Takati Mission International. They're 52-plus years old, and in our 52nd year, Debbie and I are in our 22nd year with TMI. So we began to hold hands and pray for our family and go through prayer requests, and we began to pray the Jesus Creed. And then in my quiet time, my devotionals in the morning, I would every morning, I'm like, God, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but this ain't working. Um, I have been trying to learn to love Mexico and love Mexicans for 22 plus years, and sometimes they just really annoy me been trying to learn to love my family we're 15 now 16 on the way in May and sometimes I'm just like oh and most of you know if you've been tracking with our ministry that several years ago we started working with recruiting Latinos for the Muslim world and after just preaching my face out one day at a church similar to this I'm standing down in front, and I'm all red, and I'm all sweaty, and I've done my PowerPoint, and I preach my heart out, and I'm standing there, and people come up, and I wanted to meet and greet, and one guy comes up, and he's like, so how many Muslims have you led to Christ? And I'm like, well, uh, none. And he said, so how many are you working with? I said, I did, uh, none. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm a missionary to Mexico, for crying out loud, I live in a campground in Potentado, California, surrounded by Mexicans. There isn't a Muslim or a Middle Eastern immigrant around for miles. What do you want, dude? As I'm thinking that, homeboy reaches out and he starts poking me. Don't poke a fat preacher. <laughs> and he says, so let me get this straight. You just spent 45 minutes preaching and telling us to do something that you're not doing. Zzz. 
I'm already little. <laughs> but now I'm standing in front of the church and I'm like, I need to buy a Southwest ticket and escape or something. And while I was trying to think of all my excuses and justifications, the Holy Spirit started poking. Don't you love that? Hmm. And he said, yeah, Dan. So, several years ago, we asked the director. We'd heard about a city called El Cajon. has a lot of immigrants and refugees. So we asked our director if we could start working down there. You can go ahead and put the slide on, or do I have to do that? We started working and going down, and I'll try to just zip through this as quickly as I can, but I want to do a couple commercials. Number one, Debbie and I have a handout. If what I talk about this morning touches your heart at all, we would love to give you, it's just a page with just some simple little bullet point guidelines on what I've learned in the last two years about engaging with other cultures. I call it keys to cross-cultural ministry, but I just completed studies on Judaism, a trip to Israel, having been taught by rabbis. I'm going to a local mosque in El Cajon and I'm working with people groups from all over the world and sort of a condensation of all of that and of the last five years I sort of put in a real quick bio today and on this page and I want to do a couple commercials and I, I don't I hope this is not self-serving at all I would be happy to come Deb and I live in La Mesa now I'm only like an hour and three minutes from here if the traffic gods are smiling upon us Today, people were fleeing San Diego because the evil <clears throat> that's descending upon San Diego to try to make spiritual warfare against our blessed chargers. So we were, <laughs> we were cruising just fine coming up 15. But I'm only an hour and change away, and I will come to your home, come to the church, a class, a Starbucks, or anywhere if you want to dialogue about this. I've got some incredible teaching on worldviews, especially as it regards to shame and some of the other cultures. I've got some great teaching on Islam. I can condense and package to any age group, like I said, a home, a Starbucks, a church, any setting. I mean, I've just got hours and hours of material, not to overwhelm you, but I will bring books and articles, PowerPoints, or just even informally in a chat room session, I can give you some things so you don't have to learn the hard way and spend 10 years like it's been my journey and I'm still making mistakes. So if anybody's interested in that, please avail yourself, give me a call, text, uh, send me a message on Facebook, email or whatever. I'd be honored to come back and share with anybody who'd like to learn more and go deeper. Again, this is just a glimpse today. This is just a quick overview as God began to turn our heart from Mexico and turn us towards something else. As I got down there, I met people from a little Southern Baptist church, and that's a stretch also because I'm not Southern Baptist. And so to give you just a real quick update, I'm now the missions pastor of Meridian Baptist Church in El Cajon, California. I'm still with Takati Mission, but my heart was so impacted hearing the stories of suffering hearing in people's living rooms and little dingy apartments hearing people from Afghanistan and Iraq and Somalia and hearing the stories of the price people have paid for religious freedom or to escape or to get out of a refugee camp and I know you're familiar through Charles and some other people I know you all are familiar with what I'm talking about but it was news to me the suffering in Mexico, we only deal with three or four hot spots and drug wars and all that. Life's good in Tecate. It's not near the same story. And as I began to hear story after story, my heart broke. So I went to the board and I said, can I stay with Tecate Mission and yet work in El Cajon? And being the gracious and wonderful spiritual giant men that they are, they said, no. And I asked for an audience before the board. And the director came back and he said, no. <laughs> so I, okay, um, uh, Lord, I thought this was of you, yet I've got to follow my channels of authority. 
And then the director came back to me and he put his hand on my shoulder, big brotherly kind of way, and he said, we want you to wait. I said, well, I've been waiting for years, but okay. So we waited. And then in December of last year, I'm still getting the echo and feedback and all that. I don't know if it's the monitors or what it is. In December of last year, the executive board of Takati Mission International said, stay with this ministry, come into the headquarters one day a week, and then for the rest of the week, day and nights, do whatever you feel God is putting on your heart. So that's what we're doing. We moved to La Mesa. We actually tried to move to El Cajon. We were turned down by 50 different either owners or property management companies or agents or whatever. We simply did not have the money, the credit, our family size was too big or whatever. The Lord opened this home in La Mesa. We like it now and we're very comfortable there. Um, this is the recent, most recent family shot and um, this is setting the timer on my digital camera. My son Josh running and jumping in front. I don't know why I've got grandkids with their fingers up their nose. <laughs> my daughter's flashing gang signs back there. Um, I don't know. I look like King Tut sitting in front, this big old fat walrus and shorts or whatever. I'm sorry, folks. We tried like 10 times. This was the best of all of them, so I'm, I'm going with it. Um, praise God, another grandbaby, another bender boy baby is in the factory, and Lord willing, we'll be expanding the family to 16 in May. So there's some purposes for today, and it's... I always prepare too much and have too much material and too many slides, but if you can just scan some of these slides real quickly um, so you'll know what I'm at least trying and attempting to do, and I would like to at least share the challenge of loving, loving our new neighbor, and it's been difficult for me. It's been a journey for Debbie and I to figure out who is my neighbor, what does that mean, and what do I do with these new concepts. Now, just so you know, it wasn't a natural, normal, easy transition for me to love Mexican people. I grew up in a Mexican town. I was involved with gangs, and there was a lot of fights, and they didn't like me, and I didn't like them. Um, it wasn't a smooth, normal life transition to begin to love Mexico and love Mexican people. When I first was challenged to consider Islam was after 9-11, and like many Americans, I had all kinds of mixed emotions. The Bible verses began to speak to me and minister to me. And the Holy Spirit began to say with that gentle tapping, homeboy in front of the Baptist church was tapping hard. The Holy Spirit with that still small voice was tapping gently saying, Dan, if I'm enough for you, if my love and grace and mercy could forgive you and wash you from all that you have done, if I could call you into ministry and prepare you by daily renewing your heart and trying to get you to love other people and see others as I see them, can't you add other people groups in there? Can't you learn to love not just Mexicans and Americans? Can't you learn to love other people as well? Now, as far as a missiologist, that's the technical study of missions, Here's what many of us think. America had a chance. We had the resources. We had the mission agencies. We had the local churches. We had the funds. We had the Bible schools. We had everything necessary to reach the world and to send out workers. But we didn't reach everywhere. If you look around the back of your church wall where you see that big banner and you're aware of this called the 1040 window, the orangish color, yellowish orangish, and the red or whatever, many, many of the people groups are still unreached. The average cost to send an American family to get them from Bible school and training and deputation and support raising an outfit to the field is starting at $250,000. Many of them are there for three or four years, their initial term, trying to learn language and culture, and many of them wash out and come back home. The average age of our missionary force is 55 plus. 
Many are facing retirement, issues with education, or caring for their aged family members or whatever. And so we now are seeing something that's been going on for years, people coming to America. But we're seeing it now, not just in small, isolated immigration from Mexico and a few people from the Middle East. We're seeing it now by the thousands. And when you get here legally, you have permission to reach out many times and connect and try to bring other family members as well. We actually believe that God is bringing people here from all over the world so we can share the gospel in freedom, in love. We have resources here and we don't need to go. Matter of fact, some of the places we can't go and yet they're here. Now you've got two or three things that are guaranteed in your tool bag. You can just reach down and whip them out whenever you want. A, you have the knowledge of God and his word. B, you have the spirit of God to burden you, to help you, to give you an answer even when you don't know the ready answer. And three, you speak English. Am I guessing correctly? How many speak English? How many speak English? Don't be shy, church. Raise them up high, wave them at me. Yeah, you speak English. Thousands and thousands of students international students, business people, immigrants, legal and illegal, and refugees want and need English. So I preached in an Arabic church and a Hispanic church in this within a couple of weeks. I am trying to deal as a theologian with what parts of the Old Testament, how does this correlate with the New Testament? Are we supposed to welcome the stranger? Are we supposed to be loving and reaching out to these people? And this, just so you know, we haven't forgotten the connection with the Cadi Mission. The big guy in the back is Fernando, the first family, Mike and Graham, the first family from Takati Mission Bible Institute to go to the Muslim world. I like the guy in the back, and if you see the wise guy in the back, that must be like a Muslim version of bunny ears or something, I don't know. <laughs> Fernando's wife, Monse, is crouching down because she's real tall also. Now, how do they go to a country that's 99% Muslim as missionaries they use culture and music and teaching and a bunch of other things. And little by little, because in the home, you are allowed to answer questions. When you come into the home, and I thought Hispanic hospitality rocked, and it does. They probably beat us as Americans, hands down. But I had no idea. Hospitality in the Middle East is a code. It's a system of ethics. It's a must do they must invite you in and feed you and give you scalding hot tea and spend time and a knock on the door if they open the door you're not going to be there for five minutes how long are we normally there deb two three four hours it's incredible but when you're even in a muslim context when you're in a home you can talk freely and you can answer questions so we're still partnering with tmi we're still trying to raise up missionaries for all of Mexico and planting churches. We're still spending people. We had a missions conference. This is Ralph Canada who came and did some special training. The chapel building was filled. We had 200 pastors and their wives and students in there learning how to go as cross-cultural missionaries around the world. We just got back from a conference last weekend. We took three of our leaders from Mexico and did a three-day training called Oasis in English and a one-day training of Islam in America, even in Spanish, to teach people what you need to know about Islam, what you need to know about reaching your neighbors and people. Now, I'm going to give you just a little test or whatever. This is one of the places I volunteer and I don't do a lot of pictures. I rarely take pictures of converts or Muslims. So if you're looking on Facebook, you're not going to see photos. You're not going to see names or anything like that normally. We, we, just don't, we just don't promote that kind of thing. But I snuck a picture in one of our trainings. This lady is one of the teachers that I volunteer with from Cuyamaca Community College. Just to give you a quick test on, on Islam. What do you know, looking at this lady, if I tell you she's a Muslim, what do you know about what level of Muslim she is? Talk to me. Anybody want to make any guesses or whatever? What do you know from looking at this lady? She's not covering her face. Okay. Anything else? Good, good point. You're missing some others. Real obvious. What? She's teaching. Something else over here? 
colors, yes. The, the, some I work with are all in black, the burkas and whatnot. They love colors if the society or the husband or their, their church imam or their culture lets them. They love, and I work at a high school now in El Cajon, and the Muslim girls, even when they're completely covered and very immodest, they really work on their makeup and their eyes. They're simply beautiful. She's got a master's degree. She's a licensed family counselor. She's teaching. She's got makeup and color. She speaks three languages. She's even teaching in a room with men. So there's all levels of Islam, and I ask them all the time. When I first meet a lady or a girl, a teenage girl in a burqa, and I volunteer to high school, and they come and sit down with me, I, I get kind of nervous because I'm, I'm not certain. And I'll tell you last week, if we had time, a story that happened. But I volunteer now with Cuyamaca Community College. There's Muslims crawling all over, but not as many as you have here in Temecula and not as many as we have at UCSD. Um, I'm going to suggest, if you all have free time, that you consider volunteering because volunteering, there's something different about a paid position and a volunteer. When people find out that wealthy Americans and wealthy middle class, predominantly white Christian Americans, will willingly give their time to volunteer, it opens the door right there. It opens the door automatically, the fact that you're not being paid. Now, you need some training, and I can offer this, or you can do it online or whatever. We need to understand the worldviews that exist around us because everybody's got a holy book. Everybody's got leadership. Everyone's got cultural do's and don'ts and taboos and whatnot. There, you can't figure all of them out, but you can learn. If you've got a neighbor or somebody at your school or your kids have a student, they come home, Mom, what's a Muslim? You can target a group that you're concerned about, and you can learn specifically what kinds of things you can do and don't. These are some of the volunteers I work with at Cuyamaca. And a year and a half ago, eating lunch at a Turkish restaurant in El Cajon. A teenage girl was our waitress. And my friend David and I mentioned that we were ESL teachers and we we're looking for, to volunteer. And she said, oh, you should go to my high school. And I said, what high school? She said, El Cajon Valley High School right here in El Cajon. I'm a graduate. And I said, why should I go there? And she said, well, I used to be a tutor. I speak four languages. And I was a tutor. They have an after school program. They have tremendous need. I called the school. I, got, I downloaded the notes from the school board meeting. There's over 2,000 students. Now check this out. There's over 2,000 high school students in an American city. 49% of them, over 1,000 students, are recent arrivals to the U.S. Here's what I did not know after years of being a teacher. Here's what I did not know. If you're a kid in America, you got to go to school. It doesn't matter if you came from Turkey doesn't matter if you came from Lebanon. doesn't matter if you came from Iraq or Mexico. It does not matter if you can't read or write. You have to go to school. So it took a long time, but I finally got certified. And now three days a week for a couple hours, I sit in the library. The school bell goes. The library closes. Ten minutes later, we open. It's called Night Library. I'm surrounded every day by students from all over the world. The first time. I saw three Muslim girls coming with their little scars and everything on. I'm sitting there trying to be cool, but I'm like, me, 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 pick me, 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 pick me. You say, why? Because you like young Muslim women? Yes, no, <laughs> no. Because I'd never talked to one. Because in our trip to Spain and Morocco, they can't even talk to a guy. And when I go to the mosque or whatever, it's all men. The ladies are in another room. You don't even talk to a Muslim female if you're a guy, and these girls came up and they were smiling and everything, it is just unbelievable. I can't even tell you, and there's not even time to tell you, but with fear and trembling my first day, I've got one boy. He's smart, he's tall, he's handsome, he's a senior, and he slops down a book about that big of English literature, and he said, teacher, I need help. I said, okay, that's why I'm here. What can I help with? He opens to this famous poem called The Seafarer. Anybody familiar with it? Translated from Old English, it's all full of idioms and metaphors and similes, stuff about the sea. It's like every third word stood for something else. And I'm like, oh, Lord. Literature. You're kidding me. 
and we started and he's taking notes and I am transliterating and explaining things and going on and after about 40 minutes of this I'm going spirit of God is this why you called me to do all this training and move and lose church support am I here to help a kid understand literature and the Holy Spirit seemed to say Dan just be cool and I got to the last page and the author this is right out of the book American high school textbook right out of the book the author stops talking about the sea and starts talking about life and death and eternity can somebody read the line in red one more time a little louder for everybody please I'm looking at this, and I'm going, we're not talking about the ocean anymore. We're not talking about seagulls and the albatross and the winds and the waves and all this stuff. We're talking about life and death. And I proceeded, kind of with fear and trembling, to share the gospel with this young man from Iraq. Thank you, teacher. Very helpful. I had two and a half hours just about with that young man. See, folks, my God and your God, he does curriculum too. <laughs> I started going to a mosque. I figured, well, I might as well really dive in, right? So I went when they weren't open, met a young man named Kamir, and I said, this, my name's Dan Bender. I'm a Christian. I serve here in El Cajon. I would like to come to your mosque. What do I do? He looks at me. He smiles, and he said, you're welcome, my brother. I'm like, that's it? I told him, I know I should wear shoes and a long sleeve shirt, and my wife, if she comes, should cover her hair. I know some of the stuff. What do I do? He said, come in, come in, come in. I give you a tour. He has a business in El Cajon. He has a limo, limo service. He gives me a tour of the mosque, shows me the facilities, shows me where they hang out in the kitchen, explains everything and says, when you come, I introduce you. So the next week, I went to the mosque. I took my shoes off. I greeted everybody. Salam alaikum. Alaikum alaikum. I, I, that's all I know. I only know four words in Arabic. So this mosque preaches a message at 12 or 1 every Friday. They do prayers five times a day. You all know that, right? But they do like a message, Mike, in Kurdish, Arabic and then in English so I sit through to and finally understand what the guy is saying the imam that's pastor in Arabic the imam comes up afterwards and, he, and we talk we have a little chat or whatever and I said I'm an English teacher I want to serve what can I do to help and get this they've invited a Baptist preacher to teach in the mosque I'm going to show you a video clip right now that's powerful. It's in the middle of a thought. It's by one of my heroes named John Piper. And he's talking about, is there really a judgment, a hell in our culture, which is postmodern and pluralistic, which means you can believe anything or you can believe nothing. Do we really believe there's a judgment? Do we really believe Jesus is the only way? And what are we to tell people? Uh, Sound booth, if you can run that clip, please. Listen carefully. In a pluralistic, multicultural, relativistic, shrinking world like ours, this will be harder and harder and harder to believe. Because they're not just in Africa and Asia. They're right next door. Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, and Jewish people. You know them at work. They're your friends, for goodness sakes. And you want them to be. And when they ask you, so you're saying, if I don't embrace your Jesus, you think I'm going to go to hell? What are you going to say right there? 
Well, it's kind of complex, and there are disagreements in the church, and, and there are a lot of scholars and a lot of opinions, and weasel, weasel, weasel. We got out of that last week, right? We're done with that. We are done with that. We are real. With tears rolling down our faces. I don't want to believe that about you. I want you with me. I'm just a beggar. I have nothing. I'm nothing. Jesus came into the world to save everybody. He wants Samaritans and Muslims and Jews and Hindus and Buddhists and every race and ethnicity and socioeconomic. He wants us. He's reaching out. I'm talking to you right now. I want you in heaven with me. Go there. Don't get into an argument. Go there. Plead. So that they see. This is not, this is not an argument. It's not, look, which mountain? It's not about mountains. It's about Christ, God's Son, came on a rescue mission to every religion. Which is why Paul and Jesus and Peter all laid their lives down to reach the nations, the religions. All missions is going today to places that don't want you to come. You can say, well, if they don't want us to come, we shouldn't go. Baloney! There wasn't a city on the planet that wanted Paul to come, which is why he spent half his life in jail. Beaten with stripes five times, with rods three times, shipwreck over and over. He went into synagogue after synagogue where they drove him out. You don't go where you're wanted. You go where you're needed. You, you die if you have to in order to show who he is in a pluralistic, multicultural... Loop on there. Sorry. I love my country. I love my culture. Good or bad. I'm proud to be an American, but I'm concerned about the church, and I believe the Americans have lost the courage and the pioneering spirit that settled this vast land and sent us around the world to conquer, to wage war, to do whatever. We've gotten so commonplace, we've gotten so comfortable. We've gotten to the place where we just, we do church. We punch in, we punch back out, and then we just go about our lives or whatever. You are a plant. You are a cell group. You are sleepers in Islamic terrorism terminology. God has placed you here to infect your neighborhood, your schools, your Walmarts, everything in Temecula and beyond. We are not really that different. I know more about Islam than thousands of Muslims in the world. They don't even all know what they believe or why. Newsflash. I meet Christians every day that don't know what they believe and why. I go with a heart broken with humility and I say, teach me. So a young girl, all dressed in black, all I can see is her face. She comes to my table last week. Her name is Dua. She says, I can't say it right because we're missing some letters in our English alphabet. I start working with her. She had a horrible book of literature. It was all full of sex, drugs, and rock and roll and horrible stuff. And I excuse myself. I cannot explain this to you out of respect for your culture. I had a female teacher take her through that. And then afterwards, she came back to my table again. She said, I would like to study with you, please. And I said, okay. I told her why my culture had changed, how we departed from the commandments of God. She didn't know the Ten Commandments, but when I say Moses, they perk right up. When I talk about Jesus, the Messiah, or Jesus, the prophet, or John the Baptist, or David, or any of our prophets, they listen because they're told to respect the people of the book, Jews and Christians, and they're told to respect the prophets and I began to teach her why she's seeing in America why she's living in America that's not the way God wants it to be but we still some of us have a heart for God and holiness and I said I'd love to meet your family 
where do you go to mosque? She said, Santi. She's a Shiite Muslim, and if you know anything about Islam, that's the other side. The mosque I'm going to is Sunni. Sunni. They don't like each other at all in the Islamic world. But I said, I'd love to meet your father. I'd love to meet your family. She said, well, I'd love you to meet my dad, but he's in Iraq. They won't let him come over here. And she said, but you could email him. She gets out her Blackberry, looks up her dad's email, and gives it to me. And she said, you know, right now in Iraq, email's not reliable. She said, I know, you call him. I said, I'm going to call Baghdad? She said, yeah, you call him. He's got Magic Jack. He's got a 619 phone number. You call him. He'd love to talk to you. I called him. I'm on the freeway going to a pastor's training in Oceanside. He calls me back. We talked all the way up the freeway to Oceanside. He's a professor. He leads all the educational universities in the country of Baghdad. And he said, Dan, you may work with my daughter. You can call me or email me day or night. You can ask me any question. I am honored that you care about my daughter's education. Go to the last slide and we'll quit. One more slide. Oh, I have it. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Clueless. All right. You know this verse. You've heard this concept a thousand times. Church, God is bringing the nations here. God has given you love. You say, Dan, my act isn't all together. I, I have trouble in my life. I've got issues or whatever. You're not called to be perfect. I know all theology and even Islamic theology, you're called to love. God wants people before his throne from every tribe, every language, every nation, bowing down and worshiping him. You can teach you can befriend, you can smile, you can learn, you can serve in Jesus' name. God wants us to reach everybody. Our neighbor isn't just our neighbor. Our neighbor is anyone who needs the gospel. Would you stand together, please? As the worship team comes up, they're going to dismiss us in a final chorus. Would you just simply open your heart and your mind? If you want to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, if you care that God wants people from every race with you in heaven, would you just simply pray real quickly with me and say, God, use me to bring the light of the gospel love somebody who needs to hear about Jesus. Would you just pray that with me, please? So, Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you that your death and your blood and your resurrection has paid for our pardon and sealed our redemption for all eternity. God, one day, we'll stand before you and we'll join the chorus singing, Worthy is the Lamb. God, help us to take somebody with us. Who is my neighbor? The one who needs you. Use my life, Lord. Amen.